Hello, everybody. If you're here for the uh, 2020 Shipping Rate Change webinar, you're in the right place. It's uh, 2 o'clock, so we're probably going to give it another minute or two to let people log in and uh, manipulate their computers uh, and get everything ready. So if you just uh, hold on for a sec, we'll get started. All right, folks, we're at 2.02. I think it's time to start. I'd like to say welcome to the 2020 Shipping Carrier Rate Change Webinar with uh, Nia Post and ProShip Incorporated. We've got a great program for you today. Um, we know that this time of year when the carriers make all their changes to their rates and their fees and their rules, it can be a confusing and stressful time for uh, businesses both large and small, but our goal here today is to ease that burden and give you the information you need to uh, keep your business um, going in the right direction and limit problems that you might run into. Uh, I'll start off a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, if you have any questions, you'll notice there's a uh, Q&A box on the screen. Just send your questions in through there. We have Melissa here on staff, and she's going to be reviewing the questions. Uh, we may answer some during the webinar. Uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the webinar as well. And then um, sometimes we get a lot of questions that we can't answer them all. We do send an email out a couple days later with a FAQs document with answers to um, the rest of the questions that we couldn't get to. If you don't see the Q&A, there's a little toolbar at the bottom of your screen. I believe it's a purple um, icon. You click on that, the Q&A box should appear. Uh, and as well, if you're wondering if you can get a copy of the webinar, no, we keep that to ourselves. No, that's just, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can get a, a – that will be in the email as well. Um, there will also be a link to the audio file. So um, probably sometime early next week, once we get the FAQs done, we'll send the, uh, the presentation, the audio link, and the FAQs. So, so now I would like to introduce you to our presenters today. First, we have Justin Kramer. He is the Global Project Management Director and the co-founder of ProShip Incorporated. He has over uh, 20 years of experience in enterprise software and is a leader in driving supply chain optimization, providing expertise to customers across four continents. Uh, he's a strong advocate of leveraging supply chain technology as a competitive advantage to achieve a better customer experience. And also on the mic today, we have Lisa Blade. She's a Senior Carrier Relationship Manager at ProShip. She's a senior, uh, Lisa is a seasoned veteran herself with 15 years in the shipping and logistics industry. And she has a strong background in technical support with particular expertise in overcoming challenges for very large clients, including complex IT integrations and global project management. Um, and with that, I will hand the presentation over to Justin and Lisa. Welcome, guys. Thanks, Bill. All right, Thank so you. we want to go ahead and just uh, jump right in here, talk about the agenda. We got a lot to talk about today, many slides that we want to get into. So let's go ahead and review that a couple of things we will be talking about. We'll be talking about, of course, parcel rate change over the years. We'll be looking at uh, uh, what the United States Post Office, FedEx, and UPS are, will be doing in this upcoming year, or what they've already done. Of course, we're all looking at dim weight charges, understanding why and how they work. We're hoping to educate you a little bit during this conversation today uh, to allow you to go ahead and, and, and understand why you may want to use certain packaging or not going forward. 
Uh, we want to ensure that that you know how to check if you have the correct rates or what uh, what you need if you're going to be using uh, third-party software. Uh, we want to uh, hopefully inspire you to take control over your shipping costs and uh, uh, explain why you probably want to go multi-carrier shipping. So, but before we get started, let's go ahead and jump into a question here. We'd like to have a good feel from our audience as to what what um, what uh, uh, what, what carriers are you using right now? So hopefully on your screen right now, you're seeing the option to go ahead and select from United States Post Office, UPS, FedEx. If you are using regional carriers, such as OnTrack, LaserShip, so on and so forth, please just go ahead and check other as well. Uh, we just want to make sure that we've got a good feel as to uh, how diverse our audience is at this point in time. Um, so so we, can, we can really focus on, on uh, all the carriers or particular carriers in, in general. I'll go ahead and give this about another uh, another 30 seconds here uh, in order to uh, allow everybody to get over their computer, um, answer the poll, so on and so forth. Looks like we've got 54% response yet. They're still coming in. I see 500 out of 800 people so far. Excellent. Thanks, Bill. I, I, that, I don't have that feedback on my screen, so I, I appreciate it. All right, then we'll give it another... Uh, uh, let's, let's give it another 10 more seconds here uh, before we move forward. All right, and let's go ahead and look at those results. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so right now it does look like the majority of our, uh, uh, of our audience uses uh, all three of the majors, UPS, uh, United States Post Office, and FedEx, with uh, about 20% of our audience uh, uh, leveraging either LTL or uh, regional carriers as well. So it looks like we've got a good multi-carrier mix in our audience, and we'll go ahead and, and react uh, based off of that. Okay. So what we're looking at here is uh, uh, we, we, we want to talk about uh, all the various uh, changes we've seen over the past year. Um, we want to, uh, we to uh, go into all the various details. So the, what we're really looking to talk about here is, uh, and Lisa, did I, did I have this one for you? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I push it. Uh, so what have we seen over the past few years, the last few, few rate updates? So today uh, we'll be talking about a lot, of course. So I want to highlight a few key points for you to keep in mind. And so when a carrier gives their average rate increase percentage on their press release, uh, usually in uh, the end of the year during peak, they talk about what their what prices are going to be changes, changing in the upcoming year. They, uh, they give an average percentage generally. Um, UPS, FedEx, DHL, post office, well, the post office gets more in detail, but usually the big parcel carriers just give an average. Um, it's an average over all of their products, services, and accessorials. Um, some may not have an increase, and some may be over the percentage that they've given. Like I said, it's just an average. So as you see, uh, we're going to be through you'll see that we're going to be going through that accessorials and fees seem to increase at a much faster rate than parcel based rates do. Uh, carriers are using these accessorials to drive you to tender the kind of packages that are easier for them to process. You're going to see higher costs for larger items, heavier items, and destinations that are outside of major metropolitan areas, also known as a DAS fee, a uh, delivery area service fee. Um, you'll also see that DIN divisors are significantly lower in the last couple years, uh, so it's best that you learn all you can about dimensional weight, which we will be getting into in some great detail. Hey, Lisa? Um, yeah. Usually when I hear something's lowering, that sounds like that's a good thing. Uh, but from your tone, it doesn't sound like the DIM divisor lowering is a very good thing. No, it definitely is not. When I say prices are getting lower, everybody gets excited, but the DIM is a divisor. So um, when you're dividing by a smaller number, that makes your weight higher, thus costing you more. Uh, yeah, we'll the reality, get into that a little bit later, won't we? 
Absolutely. We're going to get into that with great detail. Um, it's one of those charges that customers find on their invoices and are severely shocked by the price. Um, and, you know, they usually go to the carrier, their software, finding out why was my rate telling me it was going to be $10 and it ended up being 20 Well, it's usually because of dim weight. And the reality of parcel shipping is that it's getting harder and harder to manage these rates without a multi-carrier software company to help your business save money. And we'll definitely be talking about that and helping you to lower the cost on your invoices. So with that. So, so you basically covered the basics, but I'm going to narrow it down just a little bit. We're really, you know, increasing rates, the amount of fees and surcharges. Uh, we're going to cover the fact that, that some of the carriers have added even more fees and surcharges. And of course, the, uh, the ever present dim weight uh, that's been a concern for us for quite a while. Um, but these are the things that we've noticed are a concern. So we'd love to, to put out another poll here to say, you know, what have you guys been most concerned about? This isn't a multiple choice one. Um, so let's go ahead and, and uh, uh, give you guys a, a minute or so here to go ahead and, and say, you know, which is the one that, that is the most impactful uh, for your business at this point in time? Uh, is it that additional handling? Is it, is, uh, we still see in the market a lot of address corrections that need to occur. Um, there's dim weight surcharges. And we're going to talk today quite a bit about the fact that delivery area surcharges, that more and more uh, uh, zip codes are qualifying for the delivery area surcharge. So even if that's not one of your biggest problems today, it might be one that we would like to prepare you for as you go throughout 2020. Bill, how are we doing on response? Uh, we're starting to come in. I see about 18% of the attendees have responded. Oh, okay. 30. I will I'll give it another 30 in. seconds or so to, to, to allow others to, uh, like I said, I, I know some people may be watching this and they kick back a little bit and they've got to actually get over to their mouse and, and uh, uh, make those entries for us. And this one you might need to think about a little bit too. That's true. Yeah, maybe there's a little conversation going on out there. Ten more seconds or so. Yeah, we're up to 54%. And I'm going to go ahead and look at the results now. All right. All right. So, wow, amazingly, uh, delivery air surcharge is the number one uh, concern for most customers, followed by dim weights and additional handling. So, luckily, we've got a lot to talk about for both uh, delivery air surcharge and dim weights. Um, and additional handling kind of goes hand in hand. They're at least uh, uh, cousins, if not brothers. Um, so uh, as we talk about uh, things to uh, help lower your dim weight charges, uh, a lot of that will apply to the delivery area search, or, I'm sorry, to the uh, additional handling as well. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and let's, let's move forward. Uh, Lisa, did you want to, did you want to cover the general rate increase concepts? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, general rate increase, um, You'll hear carriers call it different things. Sometimes it'll be general price increase, it's kind of the same thing. Well, what is it and why does it happen? This is the impact that the cost of doing business as a carrier and inflation has on both the parcel and freight carriers rates. This affects both base rates and accessorial fees. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and get some um, idea of what has changed on our biggest carriers. Yeah, let's look at some details. And remember, as we started this, we did talk about the fact that we are looking at multi-carrier. So though UPS, FedEx, and the United States Post Office, though they are the primary carriers that we are expecting everybody to have, there's a lot of other carriers that we're seeing, especially in North America, being used. DHL still hasn't left North America. Um, Canada Post and Pure Later, we're seeing a lot more customers uh, even if they're U.S.-based, leveraging those carriers, and, of course, regionals like Speedy and OnTrack. Now, we, we, because of this, we're trying to give you a feel as to how, that, how the rate changes occurred, and you'll notice that all of the rate changes this year occurred either in, in December, yeah, UPS being the, the uh, relatively early bird there along with OnTrack, um, or January. They, some of them uh, may still, you know, such as the post office, 
still haven't taken effect yet. Of course, there's an there's an odd one out here, which was pure later. Um, uh, Lisa, you've worked with a lot of the carriers for for a long time. Do you have any idea why pure later was the first to market with a rate change this year? I actually do. Pure later went out of the norm this year or last year rather, and started their rate change super early to enable them to adapt to market conditions and improve their services. Uh, their network infrastructure and customer experience um, as well. They wanted to have the peak season with their higher rates to be able to invest into the company. They're actually planning a new 30, uh, 330 million, 430,000 uh, square foot national super hub, as well as other investments into their business to serve their customers better. And yeah, it's kind of a, it was a very bold move, but um, they're making a lot of changes. So it sounds like we're seeing a lot of growth in all the carriers. I know every year both FedEx and UPS uh, make make some pretty uh, uh, material changes uh, to their networks. It's good to hear that that some of the other carriers in North America are doing that as well. All right, so so let's look at at some of these increases here. Um, so for the for the majors, of course, you know UPS and FedEx, we've got the uh, that they're at 4.9%. Uh, but, you know, before we get in the United States Post Office, because there's a lot of details that we want to go into that, um, Lisa, do you have any just ballpark figures on on uh, on the uh, the regionals and the Canadian carriers that we've got listed here? Sure. I have a, a little snippet of, of the larger of below the big three. Uh, DHL Express had an average increase of 5.9%. Canada Post raised its rates on uh, products and stamps by two cents on track um, matches with UPS and FedEx by going up by 4.9%. And then speedy delivery did not increase their rates for parcel or pallet. But like we were mentioning earlier about accessorials, speedy is now charging a fee for their delivery area service, meaning that shipments that are further from their general delivery area will incur a fee. And they were not doing that previously. So now they're lined up with all the other carriers that do uh, assess a DAS fee. Yeah, and with, with, with those regionals like uh, Speedy not having a, uh, a general increase, with OnTrack already being a generally a lower cost than the majors, uh, they're a great opportunity for, for many companies uh, that may have a large presence in the areas that are serviced there um, to rate shop between those. But let's go ahead and um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the United States Post Office and the increase that they've got there. Uh, let me go ahead and, and pull over to some details, make this a little easy for you, Lisa. Sure. So most of our viewers here are uh, USPS uh, customers. So I know that the rate changes in 2020 that haven't gone live yet are something that's uh, very concerning for you. So let's kind of go over them a little bit of detail. So our first class mail will stay the same, which is great. Letters, flats, and postcards are going to be the same as they were last year. Uh, priority, uh, priority mail will increase at 4.1%, but again, we're talking averages between commercial and retail rates. Using flat rate boxes for shipping heavy packages over long distances can save you quite a bit um, based on these, um, these increases. Priority mail express will increase by 3.5%, which is also an average increase between commercial and retail rates. And you know what? I, when I look at uh, uh, at that next line there, the fact that if I'm on uh, commercial based pricing, I can save up to 17%. It really makes me curious. How how would I qualify uh, for for uh, commercial based pricing from the United States Post Office? Well, you know, majority of our viewers are USPS customers, and I guarantee you some of them have commercial-based pricing. So let's find out who from our audience is taking advantage of this, and then I'll go into detail on this answer. Yeah, and now this poll question is a pretty straightforward one, yes or no. Um, uh, if you're, and, and we will go in deeper, and of course I'm filling time here so everybody can get an opportunity to get over and, and click their, their choice here. Um, but what we want to do is we want to see who's using it, who's saving that uh, up to 17%. Um, 
Uh, please note, if you are using an NSA, we prefer if you chose yes as well. Basically, what we're asking here is if you have any discounts. For those of you who are not familiar with what an NSA is, we will be talking about that as we go forward. All right, Bill, how are we doing for a uh, uh, response? We're doing pretty good. We're up to 43%. I will uh, like to tell everybody there's a lot of questions coming in about dim weight, and it's coming up shortly. So um, hold on. Be patient. <laughs> Get to the I will definitely of the go into detail. Dim weight yeah. is one of the things that I received questions on daily when I was working for a carrier. So uh, it's something that I know a lot about. So we'll be definitely answering those questions. Great. All right. Let's go ahead and let's look at our results. Let's do it. All right. So it looks like nearly 60% of our audience is using either commercial based pricing or some type of discounts from the United States Post Office. And 40% of you have an opportunity, a potential opportunity to save, uh, uh, to save some money on your postal shipping. So let's go ahead and um, uh, and let's go ahead and move to the next slide where we talk about how you can qualify for commercial-based pricing. Sure. So the easiest way to take advantage of commercial rates through the United States Postal Service is to go through a shipping software such as NeoShip. If you ship through the post office directly, there is an application process through USPS, and there are some shipping minimums that you must meet in order to qualify. So if you have um, the shipping software, you can take advantage of these kind of discounts using the commercial-based pricing. So software, uh, shipping software like NeoShip also guarantees that you'll be taking advantage of the latest technologies that are provided by the post office such as printing an IMPB label that gives you advanced tracking commercial rates and saves you a lot of money on all of your post volume. So I would also like to mention the next Thursday, Quadient is going to be doing the USPS seminar. Um, at the end of our presentation, we'll give you the details for that if you would like to attend. Yeah, so, so again, we know there's lots of questions out there. We're seeing them come in about uh, uh, how you qualify for this, things of that nature. Um, again, on the surface level, this is just a discount from the United States Post Office uh, for using uh, means of, of producing uh, their labels that is easily trackable by them, so on and so forth. Um, and if you want to know more, we strongly encourage you to attend next week's webinar where they can go into significantly more detail as we're trying to cover many, many carriers during this one. And, and, and to do that, let's go ahead and, and let's move forward and let's talk a little bit more directly about uh, uh, the uh, United, uh, UPS's rate change for this year. Now, we saw that they were going up by 4.9% on average. So this is an area where if you are using uh, UPS or FedEx, because they had a similar uh, um, general increase, you want to look at the lanes you're using most frequently. Because an average of 4.9% doesn't mean that the lanes that you are most interested in didn't go up by 10%. And lanes that you use less frequency didn't drop by, you know, didn't have a, a, a significantly lower increase, maybe a 1% increase. So, so that it averages out to that 4.9. So you really want to be able to look at that um, or you want to be able to compare against other carriers. Uh, of course, the carriers have been continuously adding new fees and surcharges. Uh, this year, along with a rebuild fee, there's a prohibited item fee. But Lisa, do you know anything about this prohibited item fee? It, it sounds kind of uh, uh, unique to me. It is. So UPS's definition of this fee is that it'll apply to packages containing prohibited articles or restricted articles that are not in compliance with UPS policies and procedures. So basically it means that, well, Let's put it this way. Um, you're contractually allowed to ship dangerous goods or items such as gold, firearms, and perishables or any other kinds of things, but the regulations were not followed. There will be a fee assessed. So it's not necessarily a fee. It's kind of more like a fine. So yeah. um, making sure that you follow regulations and making sure that all the paperwork is in order and having an expertise on what those uh, regulations are will save you this fine from UPS. Yeah, and that doesn't even include the fines that you'll get from the uh, governing bodies for transportation. So yeah, Correct. always want to make sure you're doing your, your, uh, your dangerous goods, limited quantities appropriately. Um, okay, 
So uh, let's let's uh, keep going forward here. Now, a couple of things that we're noticing is is that, uh, and, and this will be recurring here. There's now a new fee for for packages that are over 50 pounds, right? There's more additional handling surcharges uh, that are being given. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that as as we continue to go through here. But the other thing is that more zip codes, as I mentioned before, are being added to the list that qualifies for whether you call it an extended area surcharge or a delivery area surcharge. That list has increased. Um, you can tell that carriers want smaller, denser packages um, that are going uh, well within the, the population areas. And we'll see this trend occur over and over again. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, UPS is, is also trying to do flat rate boxes. So they are adding a new simple, uh, simple rate service, uh, which allow you to do that. We'll talk about the pros and cons of using some of those flat rate services as you go, go forward. Um, and it, down at the bottom of the screen here, hopefully you have perused uh, uh, some of the surcharge increases and new surcharges that have become available. But let's go ahead and, and, and let's, uh, let's keep moving forward and let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the other major carriers in, in North America, FedEx. Lisa, you want to go ahead and uh, look at that one? Lisa, did we uh, did we lose you? Or are you stuck on mute? No, I was. There we go. I was just making sure the slide is there. No problem. So, um, FedEx. With FedEx, let me give you some insight to this rate strategy that they have going on here. Freight is going up by 5.9%. Ground and home is increasing at a lower percentage at 4.9. However, the accessorials associated with heavy, large and bulky packages on the home and ground services have increased their fees. Additionally, handling charges are going to apply to shipments over 50 pounds. Oversized packages um, will also assess this fee as well. So, you know, it's the same as what Justin was saying about UPS. Those bigger, heavier boxes are getting um, a massive up on that rate. Yeah, and do you have any sure. idea uh, what what the carriers are going for? Why they're pushing for these smaller, um, uh, uh, lighter packages? Sure. So, large, heavy, and bulky items are not conveyable. Conveyable means that they can be put on a conveyor belt and automated. Therefore, they're less expensive to the carrier. The carriers mm -hmm. are investing millions into these hubs and station auto sort systems because the return on that investment is huge. The accessorials that you're seeing are specifically to guide shippers into their sweet spot. So you remember earlier, I was mentioning that the carriers are manipulating their rates to get the shipments that they want. Conveyable shipments hit that sweet spot where the carrier receives the most profit. Um, so a package that can get through an auto sort system without human intervention has the easiest, fastest path from your door to your customers. It's also the most profitable for the carrier, so they're going to do what they can to encourage you to tender these kinds of shipments. Smaller, denser shipments that weigh less are easier for people to pick up and put on a conveyor. That's basically basically what it boils down to. Yeah, and with this last one, with the delivery of surcharge, it seems like um, uh, it seems like labor is really a key here because they want to minimize the labor within their sort facilities. And I want to minimize how far somebody has to drive from those sort of facilities. So at least what it seems like to me. Yeah, I'm sure fuel fuel costs has a lot to do with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and, and move on, and we're going to talk about uh, what we've been seeing a lot of questions uh, come up through the Q and A section here. Let's start talking about dimensional weight. And I'm going to I'm going to start off. And I'll, I'll let uh, I'll let Lisa go into all the details, but I'll start off with an introduction here. So let's say we have three different items. All of them weigh two pounds a piece. All right, we've got uh, a set of sneakers, we've got a kid's backpack, and we've got a plastic toy truck. Um, so all of them weigh two pounds, but of course a set of sneakers is relatively small compared to a backpack. And a backpack is a little bit compressible, so it can fit in a box that might be smaller than this rigid plastic toy truck. And as we can see that the dimensions on that, on that second row the dimensions for each container have to go up each time, right? And because of that, because the dimensions are significantly larger, um, based upon the math that, uh, that Lisa's gonna teach us here in a few minutes, 
um, rather than getting charged seven dollars and eighty five cents, we can see that we can be charged up to sixty three percent more because that that toy truck, being a plastic toy truck and relatively large, is not very dense. It's a light item, um, uh, but it takes up a lot of, of of square footage or a lot of uh, cubic inches, and so we want to make sure that that uh, uh, we understand how that's going to affect. So. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and pull up some of the calculation stuff here, um, get it all up on the screen here. And then, Lisa, if you could go into deeper detail, I'm sure our audience would appreciate how they can calculate a lot of this stuff themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, with that big toy truck, you're shipping a lot of air. So you don't want to pay for air, right? So. Exactly. The best way, or the only way, to calculate the weight is to multiply the package's dimensions, length, width, and height. So then you take that answer and you uh, divide it by the DIM divisor. So if your package, just as a note, if your package is under a cubic foot, which is 1728 cubic inches, the dimensional weight pricing doesn't apply. So that would be a 12 by 12 by 12. So you're going to divide the length, the width, and the height by the divisor. So USPS's book divisor is 166. UPS and FedEx is at 139. So a 10-pound box. Go ahead. Yeah, this is where we were talking earlier about lower is not better, all right? And if I remember correctly, when, when the first time I saw a dimweight divisor, it was above 200. And now we can see that, that the carriers have really driven those down. Um, uh, so it, it, uh, would you agree that the, that the purpose here is uh, to, to drive down those, uh, uh, those light, large packages? Yeah, you definitely want to have a more dense shipment with as little uh, extra packing material or uh, air as possible. So for an example, if we take the length and width and height of a 10 pound box, 15 by 15 by 20, that's a, a cubic inches of 4,500. For USPS dividing by 166, that's going to be a 28 pound shipment, 27 in some, so they always round up. So a 28 pound shipment, you're gonna pay 28 pounds for a box that sits on your scale at 10 pounds. With UPS and FedEx, you'll see that with a 139 divisor, that's going to be a 33 pound shipment. So 10 pounds, you're gonna be charged 33. The divisors are lower over the last two years. Again, that is the carrier's way of steering the customers to tender the shipments they feel they can exceed expectations on and that cost them the least. Also note that the DIM divisor could change based on the service you use and also, DIM divisors can be negotiated with your carrier. Um, so with Justin's remark on you know, several years ago when DIMs used to be over 200, if you're curious, our 10-pound box with a divisor of 200 would have been a 23-pound box. So significantly less than what, what it is nowadays. Prices are going up. Yeah. So I've, uh, on the screen now, you can see those formulas. Of course, you can throw this in Excel, but let's not forget that uh, uh, this should be what your carrier soft, your multi-carrier shipping software is doing for you. You enter the dimensions, it determines uh, as part of its certification process with the carrier, whether or not that is going to be built on actual weight or the dim weight, and it should be able to show you uh, which is which, okay? And if you've negotiated, let's say a different, uh, dim weight with FedEx than with UPS, well, then your slightly less dense um, uh, packages will probably move towards FedEx in order to save you the most money. So Lisa, let's go ahead and, and uh, let's, let's move into the next area here. And let's talk about some of the things that we can do to avoid dim weight pricing. Sure. Um, of course, there's, a, there's a, several options. Uh, one is to use a package base uh, service such as UPS Simple Rate or USPS if it fits the ship. Um, those kind of services are not subject to dim weight. Using the carrier packaging can prevent you from incurring these fees as well since the carrier expects those, those shipments with their own branding on it. Well, Lisa, then why do we see, and, and of course we all see all the films uh, of the sort facilities going on, 
the majority of boxes we see out in the market right now, they're just plain corrugate. Why, why is that? Well, for the most part, shippers don't really know what carrier their shipment is going to go with at the beginning of their pick and pack process. So the boxes chosen can't necessarily be USPS if it's going to end up going to FedEx. There's no price savings there because that package is going to be subject to dim weight. Yeah, so, so, so you can often save a lot of a lot of uh, labor within your warehouse by using uh, uh, plain brown corrugates rather than uh, pushing everything to a single carrier and then still have that exactly. opportunity to rate shop once you determine the actual box size at the end. Excellent. And many of the carriers charge for their boxes and supplies as well. Mm. Whereas the corrugate, they probably have like a, a – with a warehouse kind of pricing for their core Um, So, I mean, without using the um, package based services, you could also just find the smallest box. Boxes with shallow heights are great as well um, because you don't want to pay to ship air. For softer items, such as clothing, soft cover books, flat items, you can use bubble pouches in envelopes. Those are pretty ideal for shipping that do not incur a dim weight fee. Um, you know, you, also... Go ahead, Lisa. Um, I was going to mention that um, Neopost has a product called CVP that can also help avoid dim weight pricing. Do you want to talk about that, Justin? Yeah, so the ability to, to auto-generate boxes on demand um, of course, if you have if you're if you have single items, uh, you would love to have uh, box maker certified boxes on those items, so you can just apply a label directly to them with no overpack. That's obviously the best way to avoid any dim weight fees from uh, uh, a large a large box being used for a smaller item. There's no void fill, there's no anything like that. But if you have a lot of multi line picks that you're doing, meaning you're you're doing three, four, five items. Um, and you need to have the right size box for that with the least amount of void fill, there are solutions on the market like the CVP, which will, uh, once you've uh, assembled the items on a small conveyor, will actually build a box around those items, ensuring that you have the least amount of void possible, ensuring that those items are packed tightly as possible to ensure that they can't actually shift around during handling. So that's one of the things you might want to talk to your uh, pro ship or neopost rep in order to get more information on all right. So uh, there's a question from the audience um, that I wanted to, to address. It's actually a really good question. Does UPS and FedEx measure every parcel? They absolutely do. Um, in the stations, when they're um, processing the packages off the truck that they've just picked up, they use these uh, products uh, on the conveyor belts that actually measure and weigh at the same time. And that goes into their system um, that uh, has scanned that weight. So the dim dimensional weight and the actual weight is done at the station and associated with that weigh bill so that it can be sent to billing. So yes, UPS, FedEx, DHL, I know for sure, they all redim everything at the station. Yeah, that sounds exactly like what uh, a lot of our larger customers do. They, they'll put a scan way print supply tunnel in there so they can get the exact weight and dimensions um, uh, after they, they put that parcel together. That's not always the, uh, the easiest thing for a, for a smaller customer to do, but it sounds like the carrier is using the same technology that some of our larger customers are using. Excellent. Okay, let's go ahead and... Uh, Let's talk about uh, outdated rates because this is there's a huge risk here uh, for 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 shippers um, and understand that that many carriers have an automated way for your shipping software to get those automated rates, but two in particular: United States uh, Post Office National Service Agreements or NSA rates, um, uh, which is one of the more difficult uh, set of discounts to get. Uh, this would be the level above your commercial discounts, okay? Commercial discounts, those should be updated automatically for you. But if you're a very large customer and you negotiate a national service agreement, the United States Post Office does not provide a means for multi-carrier shipping software to automatically update. So you need to work with your multi-carrier shipping vendor to get those updated. Same thing with all rates for UPS. Um, unless you're using a web service, 
any premise-based solution, UPS does not have a means of distributing uh, your discounts. Uh, and of course, you want to use your discounts to ensure that, that you, are, you are gathering the correct cost estimates going forward. If you don't keep everything updated, and of course, if you're using other, other regional carriers and things of that nature, they all have their own uniquenesses. But we're just talking about the big three, big three for now. Uh, FedEx does have automated updates for just about everything. Um, if you don't update your rates, you have a great opportunity to select the, a more expensive service uh, than necessary, uh, costing you money that you don't even know you're spending. Um, if you go ahead and uh, uh, if we're sending incorrect data because the rate charge is, is uh, incorrect, you may incur penalties. And, and basically, this all comes down to you're going to spend more money to ship the same packages, whether that, that is, in, um, uh, is in, in is incorrect fees or surcharges. And, uh, or finally, in communicating with the carrier to figure out what is wrong, you're going to waste time within your organization which, of course, is going to cost you more money. All right. Uh, if you guys have, have specific questions on this, we'd love to answer them uh, uh, offline here. So talking about uh, effectively managing these rate changes, Lisa, do you want to talk about uh, how customers might go about um, ensuring that as they have these annual opportunities, they can take the most advantage of them? Absolutely. Um, managing rate changes is something that you want to make sure that you're on top of, not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year. So best way is to keep in touch with your carrier uh, and know who your account rep is and maintain an amicable relationship with them. The better that you know your account rep, the more intimately familiar they're going to be with your shipping uh, habits. Um, and the more you can negotiate with them at a later time, do some regular reporting on your shipping habits. That's probably the best thing that you can do is to know what you're shipping from a high level. Understand what your high traffic lanes are. Understand what rate breaks, weight breaks that you ship the most. And discover the types of shipments, discover which types of shipments assess the most fees and investigate with your carrier and your shipping software provider to figure out how to reduce them. If you're finding out that you're paying a lot in, in uh, dim weight instead of actual weight, maybe assess what boxes that you're purchasing in you know, relation to what you're actually shipping. Or you know, if you're a large shipping organization, maybe something like the CDP would be a good investment for your company and would save you tons on dim weight fees. So negotiate with your carriers. You can lower your rate uh, to your high traffic lanes. You can discuss lowering your rates on the most common weight breaks that you ship. Um, I had a customer one time who, who shipped perfume, and so all of their boxes were very tiny um, and very light. Uh, and since they, there was a lot of, of fees that they have to pay in dangerous goods, they wanted to reduce the, the cost on those lower boxes, those lower sized lighter boxes, and were able to negotiate some fantastic rates on, you know, under three pounds, um, very small boxes. Uh, another thing you can talk about with your, your sales representatives to negotiate the DIM divisor to be a larger number on the lanes or weight breaks that you ship the most. And then maybe kind of accept rate increases on very low traffic destinations. Maybe the majority of what you do is, is domestic shipping and your international shipping. You have a discount now. Maybe you know the only... 5% of your shipments outside of the U.S. is, is, um, is done, you can add, accept a rate increase on your international to get your domestic rates lower. Um, and of course, using a multi-carrier system is the most effective way to lower your rates because it's going to find automatically the best way to move the shipment. Rate shopping always can find the lowest rate across multiple carriers, including your regionals, because regionals can save you a lot of money as well. Regional carriers um, 
only cover a small number of of um, states. So, you know, on track covers uh, the majority of the west side of the United States, and they have fantastic rates and excellent service. You can use them instead of one of the top three and save yourself some money. So those, those are my suggestions on how to manage your rate changes and how to lower the costs on your invoices each month. That's a, that's a lot of information. Um, so hopefully uh, uh, anybody who's got questions can go ahead and work with their uh, work with their Neopost or ProShip uh, uh, sales individuals or, or uh, account managers. Um, but we do want to kind of get a feel. How many of you are using multi-carrier shipping software? Um, doesn't have to be ours, of course. Uh, we would love it if it was ours. But uh, when I say multi-carrier shipping software, I mean software that can execute more than one carrier. So I'm not talking about uh, leveraging Indicia um, or something like that. I'm talking uh, or World Chip, but software that can do UPS, FedEx, Post Office, and maybe even regional carriers at the same time. This will give us a feel, uh, especially as we go into the next slide. I'm going to be talking about some of the advantage of multi-carrier shipping software and um, uh, really uh, uh, talking through uh, how a lot of the things that Lisa just discussed that you might have negotiations, you do need a good software that will actually reflect the results of that negotiation. Bill, how are we doing on response? So we got a little bit, a little over oh, 60%, it just changed. So um, I think you're gonna be surprised at the results too. Excellent, excellent. All right, I'll give it to the bottom of the minute here. Uh, just to let a couple more people respond and we will go ahead and show the results. And wow, wow, only 30% of our audience is using multi-carrier shipping software. All right, so uh, with, with uh, the majority, nearly 70%, uh, I'm just gonna round up to 70% here, not using it. So there, there's many things that, that you could be missing out depending upon your size, right? One of the biggest things that, that you wanna look at for, for multi-carrier, um, we talked about that rate shopping, that ability to look for, um, to look at the fact that UPS and FedEx uh, have different networks from point A to point B. Um, and those networks might, might compare favorably or unfavorably with the United States Post Office or regionals, okay? So really understanding that, that by being able to compare, not only can we look at costs, which is your basic rate shop, but we can also look at things such as time and transit. We can also allow, um, especially for our mid-size and larger customers, the carriers have been known, especially during peak season, to set quotas or to call up our customers and say, hey, we need you to stop shipping from, from uh, uh, let's say, your, your uh, Kentucky warehouse, uh, Hebron, Kentucky warehouse, to the northeast, right? And so you need to have software that can enable that. Also, there's been a ton of, uh, of activity in the last couple of years uh, where the unions associated with particular carriers have either highly threatened strikes or in the case of uh, Canada, have actually gone on strike, okay? Um, so we see a lot of concerns around that and having multi-carrier shipping software generally means that you can, you can at least shift, switch that volume over to another carrier to ensure you continue to have happy customers. And hopefully we can still do that at the lowest cost to your logistics department, okay? Um, and we want to make sure that we can make the best decisions for you. That might be business rules. That might be due to the fact that, as we said, the carriers have different networks, which means they have different uh, zone maps. Of course, it's going to be rate shopping. But it might also be, you know what, I, most of my items are, are standard, regular items that I can put out into any carrier's network. But I've got perfume or I've got um, a solvent or I've got something of that nature that I only want to work with one carrier because I don't want to get that, uh, that fee from UPS that we talked about earlier, whose name has already, already gotten. Basically, that you've shipped dangerous goods in a non-dangerous goods uh, marked, item, uh, marked package or something of that nature. We want to enforce things like that. So we want to not only automate as many things as possible to increase uh, the, the unit uh, per unit uh, throughput of your, of your existing labor, but we also want to help that labor enforce those rules along with that. So there's a lot of things that go along with that. Um, and by the way, all of your rate shopping, all of that should occur 
sub-second, if at all possible, right? Uh, sometimes for, for, uh, uh, for, for lower end tripping software, it might take a second or two. But the reality is, is that, that that rate shopping that occurs with good multi-carrier shipping software is going to occur so much faster than a human could do it. If that we want to make that decision on every package to ensure we're saving as much money as possible. All right, and let's talk about some multi-carrier shipping softwares that, that between Neopost and ProShip we have available. For our customers that, that uh, uh, are just getting into this, Neopost shipping software or Neoship is a great solution. It comes in the option of, of doing uh, uh, postal only or supporting UPS and FedEx as well, giving that opportunity to get into the market, uh, qualify for your commercial-based pricing with the post office, and then as you continue to grow, maybe bring on UPS and FedEx later and do some of that rate shopping going forward. Uh, Bill, did you want to add anything to this one? Well, just that there's actually two versions of, uh, well, I think you just said it, of NeoShip, the basic and the multi-carrier. Um, and the, the multi-carrier is really the one, one to go with. It has the one screen where you can basically set up your shipment and print out your label all in, in one shot. So that, that's my personal favorite of the two versions. Awesome, awesome. And of course, ProShip, that's all we do is multi-carrier shipping software. Uh, we're definitely for the mid-size and larger customers, um, uh, customers who are shipping uh, thousands of packages a day. Um, uh, as you can see here, we've got uh, 15 of the top 100 uh, uh, NRF retailers. Um, we focus very much on on being the, the one stop for any concern that you may have with your shipping, um, and, and we make sure we've got high availability, high uptime. We've got customers that are only shipping a couple hundred packages a day, all the way up to customers who exceed a million packages per day during peak. So um, it, between uh, our, our, our two offerings here, um, we've got something to cover just about everybody who's, who's shipping. So Bill, let me go ahead and, and uh, turn it over to you. Let's, let's wrap this up and let's get to some questions. Sure. Well, the team here has put together some great content in addition to the presentation today. You see the uh, resources list on your screen. There's a bunch of links and, um, and PDFs that you can download from, uh, from everything about NeoShip, uh, rate change resources. There's an ultimate guide to dim weight resources. Um, if you don't see that resource list, look down in the little toolbar at the bottom. It's a little green box with a little piece of paper in it. Um, and those will be available even after the presentation. You can still access the links and download them. But with that said, let's go over to the Q&A session. We're actually coming up on the hour, so we don't have much time. But we will, um, I'll, I'll talk to, uh, let's see here from Melissa, if she's got any top questions that um, are being asked by our Sure, I'm trying to keep up with everyone. This is Melissa, I'm chatting all of you. Um, so thanks for hanging in there, I told you to stay tuned. Um, a few questions that I'm seeing around just um, updating rates, whether they're automatic or not, and that there are a lot of questions in terms of the shipping rates and a bunch about postal rates, which um, we cover next week in our webinar on USPS postal rates. So can you guys talk about um, how rates are updated and how that works? Yeah, and again, it, it varies by carrier, okay? UPS does not, unless you're using the UPS web services, um, and generally if you've negotiated uh, to a certain amount or if you have a certain volume, UPS web services are, will be inadequate uh, for the throughput you're looking for, um, as well as potentially unstable during peak season. So if you are using UPS Web Services, no problem. Those will be automatic for you. For most of your uh, midsize and larger customers, you're going to have what's known as a premise solution, in which case you need to work with your multi-carrier shipping software vendor in order to update those rates. Okay? FedEx rates are almost always updated automatically, and as we get into some of the smaller regional carriers, it varies by carrier. So work with your multi-carrier shipping software vendor. If you don't have a multi-carrier shipping software, please consider our two offerings. Um, but that is something that, that you should work with your, with your uh, software vendor to ensure that you understand the uniquenesses between the carriers because they're not the same when it comes to maintenance and support. Okay. Um, I received this one was really good. Um, me a little bit. Um, there were some questions about chargebacks. Um, 
one of the audience members said they get charges like signature required and things like that. Um, are there any solutions or workarounds uh, for something like that that either ProShip or Neopost has? I can definitely talk from the ProShip side. And Lisa, um, uh, after I give a little bit here, if you want to jump in and add more, feel free. But uh, often signature required a, for some carriers should be keyed based upon what's known as a declared value or the value of the products that you are shipping. Um, if, uh, if that information is not being put in place properly uh, and, uh, and the, your, your multi-carrier shipping software isn't automatically selecting signature required for you, um, either you've got bad business rules in that system or you don't have a very good multi-carrier shipping software. Lisa, can you talk a little bit more or do you have any additional information on why the, uh, the carriers might uh, enforce a signature required? Most of the time it's value. Um, if, and, and I'm being very non-carrier specific here, but there is a certain amount of liability that the carrier will have if they see that you have declared a very large value, like on an international or um, even a domestic shipment that has a very large value. The carrier may have uh, policies that over a certain value, they're going to require a signature because they don't want to be liable for leaving a $5,000 shipment on your, on your doorstep on a doorstep or in a, um, with an uh, administrator and having it disappear and the carrier now having to pay for that. So that, that would be something that you would have to speak to your carrier about on an individual way bill basis because there may be some policies that you are not aware of or was not made aware of by your salesperson. And we're running... I have one more. Sorry, I'm going to override. I have one more just because I have a lot of colleges and universities here, and I can see that in the Q&A. Uh, do we have any information on UPS Campus Ship? Now, UPS Campus Ship is a, much like UPS World Ship, is a single carrier uh, shipping software provided by that carrier. Okay? Um, uh, we generally don't have too much information about uh, those pieces of software, as uh, that, that's what both of our products generally replace, is the defaults, whether it's the website, whether it's uh, WorldShip, Cafe, or Campus Ship, uh, the, the purpose of our software is generally to replace those. Um, uh, but we do recommend that, uh, that, that you communicate, uh, in this case, if you're a university, um, uh, Neopost has a great, uh, uh, a great uh, footprint in the universities. We've got many uh, uh, service personnel and, and sales personnel who can help talk you through those, and we'd love to give you more information uh, in person. And can we talk a little bit, just one more question before the time runs out, about regional carriers and how they work. One customer asked, um, can I use a regional carrier such as OnTrack if I'm shipping from the East Coast? I can okay. get that one. Yeah, go ahead. If you Lisa. want. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. So regional carriers work within their region. They have businesses and offices within that region. So for specifically, if you're on the East Coast, you probably can't use OnTrack because OnTrack only has offices to pick up and deliver packages on the on the West Coast. There are shipment uh, regional carriers on the East Coast, such as LaserShip and Speedy Delivery. Um, and uh, if you'd like to um, uh, let ProShip know, kind of drop, drop by our website, we can kind of talk to you about which carriers that we support that are regional that we can, uh, that we can support and, and tell you what, which areas they cover. So, and I'd like to extend that a little bit. There is a way to do it. However, it, it, it is generally cost prohibitive unless you are shipping a, enough uh, packages to commission what's known as a line haul, basically a dedicated LTL carrier who is going to transport uh, all of their packages, uh, usually uh, uh, daily, if not multiple times a week. They, you will basically commission an entire trailer to go from the East Coast into a sort center for on track. Uh, on the West Coast uh, to distribute those packages. This is generally referred to as a multi-leg shipment. Uh, it is one of the sweet spots of a, of a, a complex uh, enterprise-level shipping software like ProShip. Um, it is not something that, that uh, most of our customers 
uh, see an ROI on a return on investment compared to to the post office, uh, UPS, or FedEx until you are literally shipping a, a trailer full per per day uh, into that region. Well, that's great. I think that's about all we have time for here today. I'll do one last plug for the uh, webinar next week. We're doing, uh, we have two folks from uh, Washington, D.C. and the US, U.S. Postal Service coming in to tell us everything you need to know about mailing and shipping rates through the USPS. That's next Thursday, same time, 2 o'clock Eastern. There's a link in the resources list. That you click on that, it'll take you to the registration page. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you to uh, Lisa, Justin, and Melissa. It was a great show today. Um, and uh, everybody out there, have a great week. Have a great year with all your shipping concerns. And look for an email next week. We'll have the presentation slides, the audio link, and the FAQs for you. Um, and, uh, and again, any other questions beyond that, feel free to contact either Neopost or ProShip. You know, if you're a, a larger size uh, shipper, you go probably start with ProShip, and if you're small to mid, um, start with Neopost. Either way, uh, we'll get you what you need. To, uh, what you need. All right. Thank you, everybody, and have a great week.